go ahead and start with <clears throat> we left off or we were discussing pretty sure uh, the chapter of the ghoul in pajamas I think we're around 102 and we were um, going over the part where Harry Ron and Hermione are talking about Horcruxes and what you can do to repair a soul that's been damaged. Remorse and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, Hermione goes on and talks about, you know, how you can destroy Horcrux. And Harry mentions the Basilisk Fang. And they talk about, you know, too bad we don't have one to carry with us so that when we find a Horcrux, you know, we can kill it. Okay. So next page, it's probably going to be the next page. <coughs> Hermione's talking and saying, you know, there aren't a lot of things that can be used to destroy a horcrux. She says, the problem we're going to have to solve, though, because ripping, that's a problem we're going to have to solve, though, because ripping, smashing, or crushing a horcrux won't do the trick. You've got to put it beyond magical repair. Run. But even if we wreck the thing it lives in, why can't the bit of soul in it just go and live in something else? Hermione. Hermione because a horcrux is the complete opposite of a human being, okay? Now, Ron and Harry don't have any idea what she's talking about, about a horcrux being the opposite of a human being. But go back for a moment, mentally, to book five, Sorting Hat Song, okay? What was Hogwarts intended to be by the four founders? I don't mean, you know, school for witchcraft and wizardry. Four individuals, right? What language, what kind of terminology does the sorting head repeatedly use in describing how Hogwarts started and how it was intended to be and what happened to it shortly after its founding? Remember, it used the language of quartering and sorting, and I put this on the board, four houses, four chambers, four quarters, one leaves, and the sorting hat says, and now we're downhearted. In other words, it doesn't work right, okay? And I kind of alluded at that point to, you know, the sorting hat talking about condemned to sorting, condemned to quartering, and I alluded to the whole idea of horcruxing and such. It's not what it's supposed to be. You remove any one of them, doesn't matter which one, and it is totally incomplete. It totally doesn't work properly. So Hermione says, well, Horcrux is the complete opposite of a human being, okay? And so she has to give an example. Look, if I picked up a sword right now, Ron, and ran you through with it, I wouldn't damage your soul at all. Ron's like, big relief to me, you know. Harry laughs, Hermione, it should be. Why? My point is that whatever happens to your body, your soul will survive untouched, okay? Now, notice, what's the word I want? The subtext, the pretext, the presuppositions, let's say, upon which this whole discussion is based. That is, what is one of the, I'll use Jefferson's language, what is one of the inalienable truths that presupposes this whole conversation, that this whole conversation has to acknowledge because it's built upon it? Yeah, I'm probably not getting the response I want because I'm not making it clear or because it's so basic, you're not even, it's something you don't even consider, okay? It's the idea of a soul, that there's a body and a soul and that the soul is separate from the body, okay? In one sense, and that the soul will go on after the body's death. Right. Um, 
Philip Pullman, in his Dark Materials series, trilogy, okay, Golden Compass, Amber Spyglass, and The Subtle Knife, <clears throat> he has a very, very, very different view than J.K. Rowling. Pullman, in the, in the Dark Materials series, ultimately argues, and I'm, I use that term intentionally, the second two books in the trilogy are entirely propaganda. That is, he's trying to beat an idea into your mind. Rowling never does that. Tolkien never does that. All right? And the idea he's trying to beat in your mind is you have no soul. When you die, that's it. Your molecules just dissipate. And what you think of as you or your consciousness will be gone. All right? Fine to have that view. I'm not, you know, belittling that. But that's not the mentality that is in these books. The, you go back to the first book. What does Dumbledore teach Harry at the end of the novel? When Harry's like, oh, you know, uh, Nicholas Flamel and his wife are going to die. To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. That is, death isn't the end. What does Voldemort think death is? I think he thinks it's either the end or it's not a great adventure. And if it's not a great adventure, why would that be? Because the mind isn't organized. Okay? The mind's a jumble. So, she's, she goes on. Your soul will survive untouched. Right. What might happen to the body? You get run through a sword. Odds are pretty good you're going to die. Okay? But the soul will live on in some way. What are some of the ways we've seen? What did nearly headless Nick tell Harry about Sirius? He will have gone on. Where? I don't know. Enrolling never tells us. Why? Because she's not beating people over the head with her quote unquote theological views. She's just kind of opening a door and saying, explore, okay? Where's nearly Headless Nick? He's still here. Why? He didn't have, go ahead. Well, he said he was afraid of death. He was afraid of death. He did not have a well-organized mind. So notice, one of the things Rowling is suggesting is, in order to die well, you have to do what? How do you organize your mind? Be, I guess, in a way content the fact that you're going to die. Or okay. Be, be prepared for it. Whatever that means. Hamlet says, towards the end of the play, it means to be ready every minute to die. From what we've seen of some members of the Order of the Phoenix, does that apply to them? Definitely did to Sirius. Definitely did to Harry's parents. Mad Eye? Yeah, I think it's probably safe to say. Are there some members of the Order of the Phoenix who aren't prepared for that? I don't think so. Maybe Mundungus Fletcher? Okay. So, the fragment of soul inside it depends, talking about a Horcrux now, depends on its container, its enchanted body, for survival. It can't exist without it. That's how it is the opposite of a human being. The soul can survive after the body. But the Horcrux, this is everything. Okay? Notice what Rowling is kind of suggesting there. Well, maybe it's too strong. Let me put it this way. What might Roland be implying? Um, what might she be implying? If the ideal is soul in a body, but the soul can be separated from the body, and the body dies and the soul goes on, and the opposite of that is 
The soul is connected to the body, and if the body is destroyed, the soul is destroyed. You've got two very different competing worldviews there. Because this one, the, the Horcrux idea, that's essentially the ideology that I just referred to in connection with Philip Pullman's novels. If this is all there is, then don't you want to try to live as long as you can? What did Dumbledore say about the Philosopher's Stone at the end of book one? The two things, he says, that it gives to anyone who uses the Philosopher's Stone the two things most people would want, which were immortality and unlimited riches. And then he goes on and says, the problem is people want the things that are the worst for them. This kind of immortality that he's talking about and untold riches. What's this? What do I mean by this kind of immortality? The Voldemort kind. The kind where the body stays even if the soul has to be split into a bazillion pieces. Okay? So, Harry says, you know, the diary sort of died when I stabbed it. Didn't sort of die. It did die. Because he saw Tom Riddle's what? what? What was that thing he saw in the Chamber of Secrets? Ghost? Projection, hologram, echo, manifestation of the bit of soul, whatever it was, he saw it disappear and he saw it kind of fight against that. Okay? And once the diary was properly destroyed, the bit of soul trapped in it could no longer exist. Ginny tried to get rid of the diary before you did, flushing it away. In other words, Ginny made some kind of connection that this thing's dangerous. Okay? So, Ron, wait, the bit of soul in the diary was possessing Ginny? How does that work then? Okay? Hermione, while the magical container is still intact, the bit of soul inside it can flit in and out of someone if they get too close to the object. So what does that say about the bit of Voldemort in Harry? If it can flit in and out of its Horcrux, and Harry was the Horcrux, wow. Just entire speculation here. Could that explain anything about Harry's relationship with Dudley throughout most of his life? I think it could. That because Harry is not emotionally close with Dudley, but physically close, right? Because you don't have to be emotionally close, right? We're going to see the locket. And when the locket is touching bare skin, the person wearing the locket kind of goes all Voldemorty, all right? Harry's close to Dudley, and whenever we see when Harry's really close to Dudley, it's like sparks. Is that because of the bit of Voldemort in Harry reacting to acting on Dudley, causing Dudley to, you know, Turn on Harry. Boy, that requires a little more thought. It's an interesting idea. So, they talk about the ring. They continue talking about horcruxes and such. We go on to chapter 7. The will of Albus Dumbledore. Okay? And, let's see here. Harry gets a birthday present from Mrs. Weasley. This is around 113. 
She says it's traditional to give a wizard a watch when he comes of age. Watching Harry anxiously from beside the cooker, I'm afraid this, that one isn't new like Ron's. Ron got his, apparently it was sent in the mail, March 1st, because that's when Ron's birthday is. Um, it was actually my brother Fabian's, okay? So what's Molly's name? Where have we heard Fabian before? Pruitt. Fabian Pruitt with his brother Gideon Pruitt were killed by dark wizards back in the previous rise of Voldemort and they were both members of the Order of the Phoenix. Okay? And Moody kind of describes their deaths in heroic fashion. I think it's one of them. Can't remember if it's Fabian or Gideon. They only found bits. <laughs> he, you know, really put up a fight. Okay? So her real name is Molly Pruitt. Molly Pruitt Weasley, if you want. Okay? And she says, you know, I'm afraid that one isn't new like, Ron, like Ron's. It was actually my brother Fabian's. He wasn't terribly careful with his possession. It a bit... It's a bit dented on the back. It's not a wristwatch. I meant to bring one in. It's a pocket watch, which can be worn, carried, literally in a pocket down here, or traditionally British English society. It's worn on a waist, what the British call a waistcoat or waistcoat or vest, in a little pocket here. Okay. She says he wasn't very careful with it. Might there be another reason or explanation for it being dented? That's kind of what I think it is. Okay. Harry doesn't remember what else she says or doesn't hear what else she just gets up and gives her a hug. Why? What, what does this kind of symbolize? I don't mean literally. This is like Harry becoming a Weasley. Forget all the stupid sweaters and you know the stuff he gets for Christmas. This puts him in the family. How so? Because this is a family heirloom that gets passed on to Harry. Okay. Um, skip a bunch. Let's see what did I say? That's eleven pages on, sixteen pages on, and Scrimger shows up. And he tells them, Dumbledore's will has been read and he's left you some things. He says, you're surprised? You didn't know Dumbledore would, had left you anything? Ron, all of us. In other words, Ron's kind of like, well, we can understand Harry, you know, class teacher pet and that kind of thing. But me? What kind of interactions did Ron ever have with Dumbledore? Nil to none, you know. Hermione? Yeah, about the same. So, he reads the will, and he says to Ronald Billius Weasley, Billius means full of bile. Bile is one of the humors from the Middle Ages, okay? One of these um, essences of your body that if you have too much of will make you like that element. Bile is the source of anger, hot-headedness, okay? What color is Ron's and all the Weasley's hair? Fiery red. Fiery red. There's a popular conception, whether it's right or not, about redheads. It's what? They're feisty. They're temperamental. They're, I don't know, certain redheads go, no, we're not. You know. Yeah, some redheads love it, and most of them are feisty. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, it's, the ones I, yeah. So, he leaves his deluminator in the hope that he will remember me when he uses it. What's the deluminator? Again, turns out all the lights until it pulls the light from your sources. In the first book, it's called the putter outer. Dumbledore just magically appears on the corner of Perfect Drive, and he goes, <laughs> all the lights go out on the street, okay? To Hermione, he leaves his copy of the Tales of Beetle the Bard. I don't remember if there's some people in this class or primarily the second class, but a bunch of people on the quiz really botched this up. The Tales of Beetle and the Bard, 
the tales of Beetle, or the Bard, the tales of Beetle, B-E-E-T-L-E, -E -E, the Bards, like the rock group, the Beatles, you know, or B-E-A-A, -A, you know, various spellings, tale of Beetle, the Bard. Bard is just a singer of songs, a teller of tales, okay? So, he leaves a copy of tales of Beetle the Bard in the hope that she will find it entertaining and instructive. Horace, first century Roman author, said that the purpose of literature is to teach and delight. There should be a moral message but in order for that moral message to be passed on, what's, what comes first? It has to be interesting. It has to grab the reader's attention. You've probably read things before where, you know, the moral idea comes through, but the writing's really didactic. Philip Pullman's books that I just mentioned. When his first book, um, Golden Compass came out, also called Northern Lights. When Golden Compass came out, I got, somehow, I got an advanced copy. I mean, like a what's called a galley copy. Not even bound yet. I think it's because I was editing a, a journal at the time. And I, I thought, this guy's the next Tolkien. Fantastic writer. Fantastic world builder. All right? It's just amazing. And so I started teaching it in my fantasy lit courses. I mean, I was actually spoke about them at conferences, compared them to Tolkien the whole nine, in England, in, in Oxford, the whole nine yards. Second book came out, and the world building, the storytelling, all got left on the, on the side of the road. It all became, I'm going to beat this idea into you that Christianity and all religions, but ultimately, mainly Christianity, his grandfather was an Anglican priest, okay, are all a bunch of hogwash. This is all there is, and this is all that's important, so grab what you can now kind of a thing. And then the third book involves killing off God, you know, kind of a thing, all right? So, in hopes that she will find it entertaining and instructive, what kind of book is The Tales of Beetle the Bard? Children's stories. Children's stories. What's another word for that, another phrase, fairy tales. fairy tales. Have we had any indication at all from books one through now that Hermione has ever had any interest in fairy tales? Not at all, okay? And the in the encyclopedia, you know, when people still read encyclopedias. So he asks, why do you think Dumbledore left you that book? She goes, I don't know, because I like books. Why that particular book? I don't know. Do you ever discuss codes or, you know? No. And so Hermione says, and if the ministry hasn't found any hidden codes in this book in 31 days, I doubt that I will. Notice she turns the tables. You've had this thing, you've had the will for this long, and you're just now giving this stuff to us, okay, to Harry. I'll leave the snitch he caught in his first Quidditch match, okay, on the quiz. Um, wait, should I talk about that? Is that quiz? That quiz is due yes. tomorrow night. I shouldn't talk about that. Or is that the first quiz? That's the first quiz. That's the first quiz. Thank you. It might be on the second quiz too, but I don't think so. On the first quiz, if you put the golden snitch, I gave you credit. For the final, if that question shows up or a variant thereof, you need to tell me which golden snitch, okay? Which several people did. It's the golden snitch he caught, it nearly swallowed, in his first Quidditch match, okay? So he leaves that as a reminder of the rewards of perseverance and skill. Skill, like we said, he nearly swallowed it. And what else? The sword of Godric Gryffindor. Okay. 
And so he, he asks about the snitch. What's so special about the snitch? Your birthday cake looks like a snitch. What's its significance? Hermione, oh gee, I don't know. Maybe it's just that Harry's a really good seeker. And we haven't talked much about Harry being a seeker. Beginning from the first book. Okay. What is Harry seeking? See, she doesn't make him a seeker. Rowling doesn't make him a seeker just because of Quidditch. That's a, that's a what? That's a ruse. That's almost like a red herring designed to throw you off. Harry's seeking something much more important than a game and the golden snitch. Okay. Notice, by the way, snitch has two different words, two different meanings. If you are a snitch, what does it mean? Not a good thing, right? You tell on somebody else, you spill the beans on them, but you can also snitch somebody's stuff. Steal it. Does the snitch in the golden snitch kind of relate to one of those two? It does when you realize I open at the close, because then what does it do? It reveals, okay? Like a snitch does. So, they go on and, and keep talking. Um, Scrimger explains how snitches work, you know. And then he mentions the sword. Harry, where is it? Page 128. Where's the sword? It's funny, you know. Unfortunately, that sword was not Dumbledore's to give away. Do we know that for a fact? No, we don't. The Sword of God of Gryffindor is an important historical artifact and as such belongs. Notice he doesn't get a finish because Hermione cuts him off, but what was he going to say? It belongs to all of us, right? It belongs to all of the magical community, or at least I guess you could say all of the English magical community. It's like a national treasure. Hermione, it belongs to Harry. How do we know? It chose him. He was the one who found it. It came to him out of the sorting hat. Question, where was Godric Gryffindor's sword before Chamber of the Secrets? Yeah. Louder? We don't know. We don't know. It's not implied that it had been in Dumbledore's office. In fact, if anything, Dumbledore implied it was what? In the hat? We know it couldn't have been in the hat because people kept putting the hat on their heads for nearly a thousand years. So it was somewhere kind of like, kind of like, Lily, James, Cedric, Frank, Bertha, Wormtail's hand, were somewhere before they plopped out of Voldemort's wand. Well, now according to her reliable historical sources, the sword may present itself to any worthy Gryffindor. Okay? Doesn't make it the property of Mr. Potter. Harry, Dumbledore wanted to give me the sword? Notice Harry's wondering why. Maybe he thought it looked nice on my wall, you know. This is not a joke. Okay. Then he goes on about he who must not be named. And Harry says, interesting theory. Has anyone ever tried sticking a sword in Voldemort? Maybe the ministry should put some people onto that. And then he finishes that little paragraph. People are dying. I was nearly one of them. Voldemort chased me across three counties. He killed Mad-Eye Moody. But there's been no word about any of that from the ministry has there. In other words, nothing in the Daily Prophet, which tells you what about the Daily Prophet? 
Okay, it's covering stuff up. What else? Not reporting all of the news. That's in the broad That's sense. That's not what I'm... Remember, Rowling's writing this in the early part of the 21st century. Before much of media has become what it is today. I mean, back at this time, most of the major media, Washington Post, New York Times, the three major you know, television networks before all the cable stuff, they advocated, they talked an awful lot about free speech, etc. Now, all of those groups are advocating against free speech. They're saying free speech isn't good. We need to go back to a time period. I mean, Biden did this the other day in an interview where everything needs to be, um, what's the word I want? A museum? Curated. Everything needs to be curated and edited. I mean, Biden actually said the other day, how will people know what's the truth when there aren't any editors anymore? And some people have said, um, how did they know the truth before there were editors? They talked, they reasoned, they compared, they contrasted, they evaluated, things like that. Okay? Notice, here, what's Harry's point? I don't trust you. <laughs> you still expect us to cooperate? Scrimger, you go too far. And he touches Harry with his wand and burns him. That, what is that? Is that just a bit of anger? A scent of anger? You take a, it's described like a cigarette. You take a cigarette and you put it up against somebody's skin. What are you doing? You're torturing. You're terrorizing. That's inflicting pain. He'll have a scar from that. Okay. Ron jumps up, raises his wand, etc., etc. Grimger, it's time you learned to respect. Harry, it's time you earned it. Okay? And then he says, I don't like your methods. Remember? And he shows him his hand. So, Scrimger leaves. Harry takes the snitch. He puts it to his mouth. Why? Because that's the first part of him that touched it. And words appear. I open it to close. Harry doesn't know what that means. Chapter 8, The Wedding. Got to go more quickly. Who do we meet within three pages? It's one of my favorite characters, kind of. Kind of. Xenophilius Lovegood. Make sure I spell it right. Xenophilius Lovegood. Notice this part of the spelling. It's not F I L I S. Okay? What's Xeno? If you're xenophobic, what are you? Phobic fear of? Xenos? What are Xenos? It's an old Greek word. It means stranger, foreigner, uh, alien, not one of us, right? It's related to, real pronunciation is a k. So, xeno, like K-S, I'm a student in one of my classes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Her name is Xenia. She's Russian or Ukrainian, one of the two. Related to this, this means hospitality. So when you show Xenia to someone, you're being hospitable to them. It is a major, major, major theme in Greek mythology and literature. It's almost the dominant theme in Homer's Odyssey. Whether Odysseus is shown Xenia by the various people he comes into contact with, right? And that's because the Greeks thought, because they believed in a pantheon of gods, 
It's actually in the Odyssey where someone says something that St. Paul then quotes. Talking about entertaining angels unawares. Okay? While you practice hospitality because the person you're helping may not be a person. It might be an angel. In the Greek context, it might be one of the gods. And it often is Athena primarily in the Odyssey. Okay? So, Zeno... Stranger, other, alien, foreigner, okay, filius, love of, love of. This filius is son of. This is Latin. This is Greek, okay? Love of strangers. Love of the other. Love of the outsider. Love of the foreigner. So what's that tell us about Xenophilius? Love good. What does love good imply? Love the good. Okay. Latin phrase. Summum bonum. Okay. I don't remember the Greek phrase, but it comes from the Greek because it comes primarily from Socrates and Aristotle. This means the highest good. According to ancient Greek philosophy, in early Christian philosophy, our whole reason, our whole raison d'etre, to use the, Fran, the French, uh, or the France, if I want, um, whole reason for being is to learn this, but it's to learn to this, this, to love the highest good, and it's to achieve. That is, it's to move from where we are now and to go up a ladder. The ladder has been various called the ladder of divine love, the ladder of divine ascent. It's to ascend to the realm of the divine. Okay? Xenophilius, love good. How do you love the good? By loving others. That doesn't just mean like your family. It means those outside, okay? Describe Luna in her relationship with others at Hogwarts. She doesn't get along with most people or most people are kind of mean. They kind of pick on her. Why? She's a bit strange. I mean, Say that again? She's a bit strange. Okay, she's a bit strange. Keep going with that. Those are all strange, right? They're out of the ordinary. Okay? Who shows love to Luna? More than anybody else. Okay. Think book five. Towards the end. Harry. All of her stuff's gone missing? Harry is down in the dumps. He's just talked to Nick. I'm never going to see Sirius again. And he runs into Luna. And she talks about her stuff missing. And what does Harry do? Can I help you? And he goes from thinking of himself, love of self, to love of other. And we could go back to the first book. You know? Madame Malcolm's Rope Shop. Malfoy disses Hagrid. I think he's cool. That's a verbal showing of this. Malfoy takes Neville's remember all. Remember all. Harry does something. He acts on it. That's this. Harry stops Malfoy from being killed 
in the Forbidden Forest. That's this. Book two, book three, book four, book five. What does Rowling continually do? She shows us Harry is really the embodiment of this idea. Okay? What do we see about Xenophilius Lovegood? You think Luna's strange. He's way out there, man. It's like one shroom too many, and he just stayed there. Okay? And what does he wear on his bright yellow robe? Grindelwald's mark. Isn't the circle inside triangle? Yes. Marker. Eraser. Sorry. It goes like that, right? It doesn't look right. No, why do you all the way to the triangle? All the way to the top, like that. Been a long time. I haven't taught this course in a while. Um, so, we hear some talk. We see Harry meet Auntie Muriel. Okay. We see the wedding of Fleur and Bill. And this is around 143, 144. Somewhere around there. And we hear part of the ceremony, part of the ritual. Okay. Do you, William Arthur, take Fleur Isabel? Mrs. Weasley and Miss Delacour are there, you know, sobbing quietly, et cetera, et cetera. Then I declare you, which means they've just done what? I don't mean just gotten married. If they're bonded for life, Isn't this similar to something we saw in the previous book? Did the previous book open? Uh, second chapter, I think it was. Unbreakable vow. Unbreakable vow. If you're bonded for life, uh, what happens if you break the bond? It's implied. I'm not saying it's explicitly stated. Then something bad happens. Tom Riddle and Merope. Um, Eileen Prince and Tobias Snape. Mr. and Mrs. Hagrid, you know, Hagrid's father. We could, we could go down the list of broken families. Okay. In those, each of those three cases, what happened? One left. Why does Rowling emphasize, why does Rowling include this? What might she be suggesting, in other words? Louder? Marriage is sacred. Marriage is sacred. Marriage should not be entered into lightly, like J.K. Rowling did when she was pretty young, 21, 22. I was married really young. Also, I was 23. My wife was 20, whatever, almost 22, okay? Um, and if it is entered into, it shouldn't be broken, all right? So, the rest, yes? Is some of the wording there specifically of using bonded for life also be a reference to what's coming, like the war that's coming that we need to be Stand together. It could. <laughs> because we don't see the wedding, but who else is married? Bill, uh, not Bill, uh, Lupin and Tonks. Lupin and Tonks. And we're going to see s some hidden, uh, excuse me, we're going to see some, uh, we're going to get a glimpse into that marriage. At least on the side of one person, right? And Harry's going to do, well, 
<laughs> just talked about it. What's Harry essentially going to say to Lupin? He's just, one word. Coward. Coward. Because when we get there, what is Lupin going to suggest? Oh, I should stay with you, Harry. I could help you find and destroy Horcruxes. And Harry's like, what the hell? So you think my father would rather have you gallivanting with us around the country while you abandon your wife and child? How dare you? Who would have ever guessed? The man who taught me to fight Dementors is a coward. Lupin leaves and Ron's like, whoa, too far, man. You went too far. No, Harry says, I didn't. And I'll wait for the rest of it till when we get there. Which I'd hope it would be today, but so in the wedding chapter, Harry meets up with Crumb. Crumb doesn't know it's Harry, because he's, you know, looks like uh Barry. Yeah. Um, and Crumb's ballistic man because he sees this, which he thinks is Grindelwald's sign or mark. And what is what what is that meant to imply for us? How should we, according to Crumb, really see this, or what should we see this as? What would the modern equivalent be? Dark mark. Can anybody use this today any, anywhere? I mean, students have been turned in, grade school and stuff, for just drawing it. I used to draw it all the time as a kid. I wasn't a secret white supremacist or a neo-Nazi. Okay? The image itself goes back 5,000 years. It represents the sun. It's a sun, these are the rays image, okay? But you're not going to use that today, just like most Germans aren't going to name their kid Adolf. It just kind of has a bad connection to it. Just like most Christians aren't going to name their kid Lucifer. Kind of has a bad, you know, historical connection. Even though the name is a beautiful name. It's about the most wonderful name you could give to a child. Bearer of light. That's what it means. Okay? So, Harry and Krum keep talking. Krum mentions Grigorovich, whose name Harry has heard before in the way of the Wands. Okay? And then, Harry speaks with Doge on 149, 150, 151. And he mentions Rita Skeeter's interview. Don't believe a word of it, Doge says. Not a word, Harry. Let nothing tarnish your memories of Albus Dumbledore. And I think this is the first time this shows up in the book. Did Doge really believe it was that easy that Harry could simply choose not to believe. What's the reverse of that? Harry has to choose what to believe. Okay. Notice, he is going to be forced into a decision what to choose. He'll have to choose something, right? Didn't Doge understand Harry's need to be sure to know everything? And notice rolling italicizes everything. Why? I think there's only, at this point, there's only one reason she can do that. It's foreshadowing. Because what does the everything include? The whole plan. Harry doesn't have the whole plan so far. Okay? So notice what we're what we see right here. Uh, 
what it essentially breaks down to. Harry wants knowledge. He wants truth. And that gets juxtaposed with what to believe, who to have faith in. Okay? And Doge goes on and talks about how horrible Rita Skeeter is. Okay? Auntie Muriel pops up. And what are we told? Almost immediately. Doge looked stiff and solemn at this, but Auntie Muriel drained her goblet, clicked her bunny fingers, and passing waiter for a replacement. She took another large gulp of champagne. Notice her initials are A-M, like Aunt Marge. She's the wizarding equivalent of Aunt Marge. And she goes on and talks about how Doge worshipped Dumbledore. I dare say you'll still think he was the saint, even if it does turn out that he did away with his squib sister. Muriel! A chill that had nothing to do with the ice pain was stealing through Harry's chest. Why? Notice, the narrator tells us, this doesn't have anything to do with the hooch. Why is a chill stealing through Harry's chest? What has Doge just been talking to him about? Don't let anything tarnish your memories of Dumbledore. Hold fast to those, Harry. Believe in those. And that does what to Harry? It kind of builds up Dumbledore. Not in his mind, here. His love for Dumbledore. Aunt Muriel comes in, and she does what? She pulls, pours cold water on that, and that chills that ardor, that flame of love. It does what? It takes it from a nice big burn to a low simmer. Harry, what do you mean? Who said his sister was a squib? And they go on and they talk back and forth. A lot of talk. Okay? Page 152. Doge had been on the verge of tears. Previous page. Why? Because Auntie Muriel was doing what for his idol? Knocking the pedestal out. Okay? She goes on and talks about how her mother was friends with old Matilda Bagshot, etc., etc. She swigs more champagne. The recitation of these old scandals seemed to elate her as much as they horrified Doge. Why did they elate her? The other day I talked about Last week, I talked about, you know, celebrity biographers, and I mentioned Kitty Kelly. Well, a lot of people read those celebrity biographers and those celebrity biographies because it makes them feel better about their lives to find out somebody who's quote-unquote important and powerful is a scumbag. This, this gives anti-murial meaning. Notice for Doge, it destroys his meaning. Harry did not know what to think. Why? Auntie Muriel, Doge, Dumbledore in the middle. Who do I, who do I listen to? Who do I believe? He did not know what to think, what to believe. He wanted the truth. And yet all Doge did was sit there and bleat feebly that Ariana had been ill. Harry could hardly believe that Dumbledore would not have intervened if such cruelty was happening inside his own house. In other words, he kind of leads with Doge because he finds it very difficult to believe what Muriel was saying. Where can he get the truth? Dumbledore's brother, maybe, but even that's what? It's still his truth. It's his truth that's hearsay. Where can Harry get the truth? He can't now. Why? Because the truth has died. The real truth of what happened in that room, in that house, all those years ago, cannot be known. Well, until we get to King's Cross. <laughs> so what's Harry left with? If you've never read Flannery O'Connor, it's a good man is hard to find. Read it. It's about a misfit. He calls himself the misfit. He's a serial murderer. 
Escape from the state penitentiary. He meets his family on the road. They've broken down. He, I won't say, but, but he has this little conversation with this old grandmother at the end of it. And he says at one point, don't have time for this. He says at one point, Jesus threw everything off balance. And she's saying, just pray to Jesus, pray to Jesus. He says, Jesus throwing everything off balance. He speaks in dialect. And what he goes on to say is, Jesus raised, the pe raised people from the dead. Only problem is, I wasn't there. What's his point? I didn't see it. How do I know it's true? If it's true, he says, then there's nothing but to fall on the ground and worship Jesus. If it's false, that is, if the last 2,000 years is a lie, then there's nothing but meanness and going around and taking what you want and killing as many people as you can. And what, what O'Connor is doing there is she's juxtaposing Christianity with its flaws, with nihilism. No meaning at all to your life, to existence, etc. Okay? Harry's kind of in a similar boat. Because all he can have, and this is what the, the misfit is getting at, all he can have is faith. You know, read, read the gospel account. One of the apostles is not there in the upper room after the resurrection. You know, eight days later, they're all gathered together, and Jesus appears, talks to him, etc. Thomas isn't there. Next week, they're all together again. Thomas was with them, and he's like, hey, guys, you tell me all you want. Until I see him with my eyes, put my hand in his side, and my finger through the hole in his hand, I will not believe. He chooses not to. He feels a tap on his shoulder. According to the account, Jesus is there. And all he does is, come on, Thomas. Feel it. Feel it. I'm real. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Jesus says, blessed are you who have seen and believed, but more blessed are those who haven't seen and believed. I think all of that is wrapped up into what rolling is kind of getting at here. So that, you know, when I mentioned early on in the, in talking about rolling, you know, there is that um, writer, Lev Grossman, Lev Grossman. When that writer did an interview with her when this book came out and said, you killed God. Where is God in this book? God's nowhere. And she's like, dude, he's not as absent as you think he is. Okay. Doesn't matter what your belief system is. He's an atheist. An atheist does not allow for the, exist for the possibility of that existence. Rowling has said she's not. Okay, so she does allow for that possibility. So, what, what's the real importance of the conversation with Muriel? What does she tell Harry? Where's Matilda Bagshot from? Godric's Hollow. Who else? It's from Godric's Hollow. The Dumbledores. the Dumbledores. And Harry's like, what? You mean Dumbledore? Like, lived down the street from my parents? Okay. A place to hide. So the party gets crashed. The wedding gets crashed, right? Kingsley sends his Patronus and such. The ministry has fallen. Who's dead? Scrimger's Scringer. now dead. Who's the new minister for magic? Thickness. Pious thickness. Okay. And Hermione takes Harry and Ron to Tottenham Court Road in London. If you go up Charing Cross Road in London, it'll take you eventually to Tottenham Court Road, right? Um, it's one of the major intersections. British museums, so looking at it from your perspective, Charing Cross Road goes like this, Tottenham Court Road is here, British museums over here, the theater district is all down here, kind of along Charing Cross and Shaftesbury and such. They go into a diner, 
Hermione mentions Voldemort's name. Um, Harry spots Dollhoff and Raoul. They get attacked. Harry defeats them and such. We're going to skip a bunch. Um, 175, they've gotten to the headquarters. In 175, which is the last page of the chapter, Harry has to run into the bathroom because he feels like he's going to throw up. And he sees something. What's he see? Draco, give Raoul another taste of our displeasure. Do it or feel my wrath yourself. And what are we told about Harry? Harry feels pity. Harry felt sickened by what he had seen, by the use to which Draco was now being put by Voldemort. Notice what Harry doesn't think. Get him. Get him, Voldemort. Punish Draco. He doesn't think that. He thinks, oh, poor Draco. Because Draco has now become what? Merely. A puppet. A puppet. He's a tool. Okay. Creature's tail. Third paragraph. The grief that had possessed him since Dumbledore's death felt different now. The accusations he had heard from Muriel at the wedding seemed to have nested in his brain like diseased things infecting his memories of the wizard he had idolized. Notice that they nest in his brain and in fact, it's almost like there's an ooze coming down from his brain that's going to reach eventually his heart. Because we're going to reach a point after Godric's Hollow where he's going to be at his proverbial lowest point. I mean, he's at the bottom of the barrel. He's nihilistic at this scene. Also, just so happens to be Christmas Day. Okay? Why had Dumbledore told him? Why hadn't he explained? Had Dumbledore actually cared about Harry at all? Just kind of hold that idea in mind with what we find out in King's Cross. Or had Harry been nothing more than a tool to be polished and honed? but not trusted, never confided in. In other words, what's going on in Harry's mind is, am I for Dumbledore what Draco was for Voldemort? Is this merely a proxy battle between Dumbledore and Voldemort with Draco and Harry? Doesn't like thinking that, so he starts exploring He goes into a room. He finds a portion of a letter under the bed. From his mother to Sirius. Okay. He got some interesting information. James is frustrated because he's locked up. Takes us back to book five, right? Sirius is frustrated because he's locked up. Dumbledore's got his invisibility cloak. So he can't get out. Wormy was here last weekend. Seemed down. Probably the news about the McKinnons. What did Mad Eye tell us about the McKinnons? They were killed. Okay. And Harry thinks, a couple pages later, the only potentially, potentially useful thing about this letter is its information on Dumbledore. Okay. But it's not. So, a couple pages. Later, around 180, I think that's 28, 181, 182, 183. They're, they've been talking, Harry and Hermione have been talking. Harry mentioned what Muriel said. And Hermione says, do you really think you'll get the truth from a malicious old woman like Muriel or from Rita Skeeter? How can you believe them? You knew Dumbledore. Okay? Knew implies truth, facts, etc. Right? Well, he'd had multiple experiences with Dumbledore. 
How many experiences had he had with Auntie Muriel? The wedding, and she was what? Drunk. Okay. How many experiences had he had with Rita Skeeter? And she wasn't drunk, but she's a malicious old, you fill in the blank. When had she ever told the truth? Why? Because Hermione kind of... Hermione blackmailed her. I mean, she had a proverbial gun to her head. All right? So, how can you believe them? Malfoy, bad faith, right? I thought I did, he says, talking about knowing Dumbledore. But you know how much truth there was in everything... Rita wrote about you. Doge is right. How can you let these people tarnish your memories? So what should his memories of Dumbledore be? Because think of the verb tarnish. He had all these good memories of Dumbledore from his time at school. What, what gets tarnished and needs to be polished? Silver. Silver. Gold. Okay. So your memory should be what? Pure. And they're tarnishing them. He looked away, trying not to put away, betray the resentment. There it was again. Choose what to believe. He wanted the truth. What does that mean? And notice, why was everyone so determined he should not get it? What does that mean? Choose what to believe. He wanted the truth. What is the narrator telling us about Harry's idea of truth? Jesus said, you shall know the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Pilate asked, what is truth? And Jesus didn't answer, okay? What is Harry assuming about the truth? It will be incontrovertible. It will be proof. It will be fact. It's not something that you can say yes or no to. It'll just be a mere acquiescence and going along. Whereas belief requires what? Work. You got to keep at it. Why? Because doubt creeps in. Do you ever doubt that two plus two equals four? Do you wake up some morning and go, you know, I don't know that that's going to work today. Or that gravity isn't real or isn't constant? No. So, Regulus's room, R-A-B, the locket, the false locket. And so they decide, let's search the room. Regulus Arcturus Black, by the way, notice, Sirius' name is Sirius Black. They're both named after stars, okay? Run, how are we supposed to find it? Because how have they searched Siri, uh, Regulus's room so far? Oxio locket. They tried the easy way out. Harry says, we do it, or Hermione says, we search manually. That is, you get down on your hands and knees and you look under everything. This idea is important because, yeah, should I go there? How do they bury Dobby? Why? It, well, I feel like there's a lot of reasons. It's more personal that way. I think there's more something to be said of the elves. They had to do the work and manual labor. So that's what Harry did for him. But Harry says, no, I want to do it right. So why is doing it manually right? Harry's a wizard. Why isn't it doing it the way they buried Aragog? Right. I think everything you said is correct. I can't remember if you said one thing, though. It's respect. It's respect. Okay? Which we'll talk about when we get to. So, they don't find it, obviously. They do think about Mundungus Fletcher, who they've already caught doing what? Thieving? Stealing? Okay, so they talk to Creature, and 
Hermione has to explain, and, and Ron explains, you know, elf magic isn't like wizard's magic and such. And what do we learn? Okay, Voldemort gave Creature an order when they were in the cave. Creature didn't obey it. Why not? Voldemort isn't his master. Regulus was his master. Regulus's orders trump Voldemort's orders. And just because he had magic put on him by Voldemort doesn't necessarily work, okay? So somewhere around 180, uh, 193, 194, 195, Harry says, I don't understand you, creature. Voldemort tried to kill you. He killed Regulus, and yet you're still essentially serving him. Hermione, Harry, creature doesn't think like that. He's a slave. House elves are used to bad, even brutal treatment, right? He should remember that from his conversations with Dobby. What Voldemort did to creature wasn't that far out of the common way. What do wizard wars mean to an elf-like creature? And she goes on and she talks about, you know, the black family, etc., etc. Regulus was trying to protect them all by doing what he did. Harry mentions Sirius. He shouldn't have mentioned Sirius. Why? Sirius was horrible to creature, Harry, and it's no good looking like that. Notice that bit of almost like editorial slash directorial comment, so that when a screenwriter sees this, the screenwriter needs to include some kind of direction of, Harry needs to give her a frown at this point. You know it's true. I've said all along wizards would pay for how they treat house elves. Well, Voldemort did, dot, 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 she pauses, because now she's loading both barrels, and so did Sirius. Well, why did Sirius die? Because Creature lied, partially at least. And Harry doesn't blow up, because like Frodo, thinking of Gandalf's conversation about Gollum and pity, he remembers Dumbledore's conversation about Creature. I do not think Sirius ever saw Creature as a being with feelings as acute as a human's. Which shows us the irony of Sirius's character. Because what did Sirius tell Harry, Ron, and Hermione in the chapter, Padfoot Returns, in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire? When he tells Ron, Hermione has the measure of Black, of um, Barty Crouch. You want to take the measure of a man, how's it go? Look how he treats his inferiors, not what he does. Look how he treats his inferiors. But what, as a defense of Sirius, what is Sirius talking about there? By inferiors. Now I take that back, it's not a defense at all. Because <laughs> he's talking about Barty Crouch and Winky, and he's totally blind to his own treatment of creature. Is his treatment of creature because of his hatred of creature? No. What is it? It's because of what creature reminds him of, of the house he grew up in, the home he hated. And the home he ran away from. And the family he ran away from. Okay? So Harry says, creature. When you feel up to it, please sit up. And then he gives Creature the false locket. Ron, overkill, mate. Can there be overkill in that situation? No. So he gets Creature to go to work for him. Chapter 11, The Pride. All right? 207. Um, we see the the paper with the one for question about the murder or about the death of Albus Dumbledore and it's Harry. Okay. Lupin's there. Lupin explains to them what's kind of been going on. Says this was genius on the part of Voldemort. Making everybody doubt you, Harry. Okay. Now that Dumbledore is dead, you were sure to be the symbol and rallying point for any resistance. And so what has he done? He's made people do what? about Harry. It gets back to this. 
no longer believe. The idea of belief or unbelief permeates this book. Okay? So, he talks about, they read about the Muggle-born Registration Commission. Ron, people won't let this happen. What does he mean by people? Everyday, good, law-abiding witches and wizards. Lupin, it already is. That's why the other day I put up on the board, I think for this class, I put it up over here. All that is necessary for evil to thrive is for good men to do nothing. Ron says people won't let this happen. Lupin says it already is. Why? Good people are doing nothing. Because what does going up against Voldemort entail? What do you do to yourself and to your family? Put a bullseye on you. Okay? So, they keep talking about all that. And that's when Lupin brings up, I should stay with you. I should go off with you and help you. Uh, uh, two, ten? Yeah, two, ten. Or thereabouts. So Harry's wrestling with this. And he says, um, let me be clear. You want to leave Tonks at her parents' house and come away with us. Now, Tonks is pregnant, okay? She'll be safe. I'm sure James would have wanted me to stick with you. Uh, I'm not. Pretty sure my father would have wanted to know why you weren't sticking with your own kid. Notice he leaves Tonks out of it for the moment. You don't understand. Oh, there it goes again. Notice he doesn't say, you're too young. Probably would have. Harry, explain. Uh, I made a mistake in marrying Tonks. Go back to the wedding ceremony for Bill and Fleur. Is, was there anything in there about, you know, oops, if I made a mistake? Bonded for life, unless you no longer have the warm fuzzies for each other. And I've regretted every very much ever since. Oh, Harry says, okay. So you're going to dump her and the kid and run off with us. Thanks, Tom. Almost wish Harry had done that. Call Lupin Tom Riddle. Okay. Lupin springs to his feet. Don't you understand what I've done to my wife and my unborn child? I should never have married her. I made her an outcast. Why? Why is Tom's now an outcast? She married an other. How is Lupin an other? He's a werewolf. You've only ever seen me amongst the order, and the order does what? They love others. Why does Dumbledore send Hagrid off to the giants? Hagrid's suited for the job. Okay, because he's suited for the job, but to get the giants on their side. He tells Fudge at the end of book four, you should send an envoy to the Giants now. And he's like, no, we can't. Most people are afraid of them. Why? Because they are other. So my kind don't usually breed. It will be like me. I'm convinced. How can I forgive myself? What does he think he's going to pass on to his child? The werewolf. Werewolfism. So there aren't real werewolves today. Never were, probably. So what's she using the werewolfism, possibly, as an image of? Think of a modern disease. Not COVID. Uh, what was muscular dystrophy? Muscular dystrophy? Yeah, but that's kind of a socially acceptable disease. AIDS. HIV. You didn't... Those are still, you shouldn't be passing that on, okay? It's, it's kind of that. And that even today is much more quote-unquote acceptable than it was time frame. I remember you know, quite clearly the mid-80s. 
when he had idiots, my opinion, you don't have to accept this, but I'm going to say it anyways, idiots like Anthony Fauci saying you can get AIDS from being in close contact with someone. You didn't even have to have sex. S sound kind of similar to... <clears throat> Sorry, I won't go off, go off on that. So, Harry says... Well, if you think the if the new regime thinks Muggleborns are bad, what will they do to a half werewolf whose father's in the order? My father died trying to protect my mother and me, and you reckon he'd tell you to abandon your kid and go on an adventure? Oh, how dare you! You think I'm doing this for glory? He says, "Yeah, I take your feeling up in a daredevil, daredevil. You fancy stepping into serious shoes?" Meaning. You kind of want to take front and center at this point. Why? I think it's implied. James and Sirius always outshone Lupin. Hermione, Harry, no! I'd never have believed this. And that's when Harry locks both barrels. The man who taught me to fight Dementors, a coward. Lupin zaps him, leaves. Ron says, too much. Harry jumps at Hermione, snaps at Hermione. Ron says, leave Hermione alone. Okay. Harry, he had it coming to him. God, is it not wrong? Broken images were racing each other through his mind. Sirius falling through the veil. Dumbledore suspended, broken in midair. A flash of green light, his mother's voice begging. Parents, said Harry, shouldn't leave their kids unless... Unless they got to. What's he mean by they got to? Death. It's the only way. Echoes? Oh, I think so. And I, you know, echoes later on. Because one of the reasons for the epilogue is because it kind of takes us back to the beginning of book one. Where we have an orphan. Little Teddy Tonks is the new Harry Potter. <laughs> okay, but what else? J.K. Rowling's mother, who died when she was in her early 20s. J.K. Rowling's early 20s. Her mom was in her early 40s. Her ex, I think that's kind of wound up all in here. If it makes him go back to Tonks, it'll be worth it. Wounded. Okay? Big speculation. Sheer, you know, off to Mars speculation. If Lupin had stayed with Harry, Ron and Hermione, would little Teddy Tonks have a parent living at the end of the book? We have no way of knowing. I think mean, more than likely, probably not. Probably would have died sooner than he did. Okay. So we get the extract from Rita Skeeter and um, Creature brings Mundungus back. Mundungus tells them where the locket is, some ministry hag, appropriate term, by the way. Chapter 12, Magic is Might. All I want to talk about this chapter is not them going and raiding the ministry. It's what has taken the place in the atrium at the ministry. You know, before, there was the fountain with the statue, with the wizard pointing his wand up, and the witch looking lovingly at him, and the centaur, and the house elf, and the goblin looking worshipingly up at the witch and wizard. And Dumbledore tells Harry at the end of book five, that's a lie. That's a lie. And we're going to pay. We, the wizarding world, are going to pay for it. Okay? Now what's there? Witch and wizard on a throne. What's the throne made of? Muggles. The throne isn't a seat sitting on a platform of muggles. The throne is comprised of muggles. And beneath the throne is written... Magic is might. 
In other words, might makes right. This is social Darwinism on steroids. If you have the power, what? You have the right. Okay. So they get the locket and leave. They free some people. We're going to skip whole Muggleborn Registration Commission. And we will pick up. Yeah, actually, hold on. Um, We're going to pick up around page 267, somewhere around 267, 268 in the chapter, The Thief. Okay? We'll do that a week from today for those of you who want to um, show up. So we're not quite halfway through. We'll be able to get it all done, I think. All right. Quiz due tomorrow night. Final is due on Sunday night. Um, don't think there's anything else. <laughs>